Okay? So the next part of this is sort of a, this is a, a high level introduction to <coughs> what this new sort of to be 36 unit course is about. So these are actually, I actually t had my secretary type up some of my notes, which will not be very useful for very long. You guys want these? Hmm? No? Okay. Um, these should be posted on the web eventually, uh, so far as that goes. But the purpose of the course now is not just welding and joining, which is the NAFC requirement. Are you videotaping now? Okay. It's actually now supposed to be expanded into materials manufacturing, which would include casting, forging, um, rolling, uh, anything that imparts to me materials manufacturing is something that imparts geometry okay I mean you can take you can take a simple bar of material this is a bar of copper we'll talk about it at some point but you might want to um, impart shape this is part of a forging that obviously is going to be some sort of impeller or whatever it's going to be machined in a little bit further uh, so you want to impart some sort of geometry. Sometimes you're just trying to flatten something. This is, I think we'll get into rolling this in some of the live lectures. This is a mistake in rolling. You know, they rolled the plate, which was half inch aluminum plate. And because of the way they rolled it, it split right down the center. It's not very useful unless you're trying to split it down the center. And actually, there are times when we are trying to split things down the center as part of the forming operation. That's the way, one of the ways we make seamless pipe. You split it right down the center. So there's little tricks that we use on things. So you're trying to impart geometry, and then uh, you, that's going to give you some sort of function. In this case, I'm using function in the sense of uh, Um, function in terms of some sort of mechanical function, like an impeller, okay? Or here's shape, here's an I-beam. When I worked at Bethlehem Steel, this is what we did. We made bookends, right? This was back in the old days when Bethlehem Steel still existed, and it was second largest steel company in the world. We had a beautiful research laboratory on top of South Mountain in Lehigh, Pennsylvania, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Anyone from go to Lehigh University or anything? Okay. Well, in any case, Bethlehem had gotten its start by learning how to roll I-beams. And sometimes people, and it, it became second largest after U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel was Andrew Carnegie's company. Um, and the guy, his number one, his number two person at U.S. Steel went and formed a co company called Bethlehem Steel. And Bethlehem had two claims to fame. One, it had learned to alloy steel around 1900 with molybdenum. And they learned to make tool steels, steels that could take, keep their strength at very high temperatures, like drill bits, okay? And so they learned that you could, you could make tool steels, and that was an important breakthrough. The other thing is they learned to roll I-beams. And later in the course, we'll talk about rolling of I-beams and how things have improved. But some people say that the growth of Manhattan was because of Bethlehem Steel learning how to make I-beams. Until around 1900, buildings never went above 10 or 12 stories anywhere because when you make, it, make, it, make them out of bricks and mortar, you just can't go but so high. You need a strong backbone to go very much higher, and that needed to be steel and you needed steel with a particular shape. Why is the I-beam such an interesting shape? Some of you must be mechanical or civil engineers. Anybody a civil engineer? No, nope, no civil engineers in here. Any mechanical engineers in here? Okay, 
One person will admit he's a mechanical engineer. So I ask everyone else, what's the moment of inertia of this? How many of you know what a moment of inertia is? Some of you are saying yes. I guarantee you, maybe not you nukes, but okay, the rest of these guys learn how to build ships. They're going to know what a moment of inertia is before they graduate from MIT. But what's a moment of inertia? Uh, it's the rotational equivalent of the mass with respect to right. um, acceleration. Yeah, it's, it basically is a measure of the stiffness in any direction is another way to think about it. Okay. It's the moment of inertia is the mass in, in any direction, but it turns out it's also proportional to the stiffness, how easy it is to bend it. So trying to bend an I-beam in this direction, you've taken a lot of your mass out of the center where you don't need it. You only need the mass at the ends, and that's what the flanges are all about. So if you put the mass on the ends where you need it, if you're going to bend the I-beam as a beam, like the floor of a building, okay? However, in this direction, it's not quite as useful, okay? In twisting, it's sort of lousy, okay? Uh, so there are lots of different moments of inertia for a given structure, and if you go through the Civil Engineer's Handbook, they will give you the moments of inertia in different directions for different shape I-beams and channels and angle irons and things like that. And that's what a civil engineer, traditional old, old style civil engineer used to spend their life doing. You know, you could they'd be not much more than a draftsman who knew how to read the steel construction manual and would design buildings and bridges worrying about moments of inertia and stiffness and try to get the um, greatest strength for the least weight, right? Because steel costs money. Well, so that's part of your function, the, the shape and the microstructure imparts um, function. This is part of a, this is a continuous casting, or a slice from it, that, <clears throat> anyone been on the Accela train between uh, Washington and Boston? No one's ever, you've been on Accela, okay. Well, it's an electrified train, and electrified trains either have they get their power from the ground, from a th live third rail on the ground, or they can have a trolley wire up above, right? You've seen this on not just the Accela, but this is a piece of the trolley wire that hangs, was supposed to hang between New Haven and Boston when they were upgrading for the Accela. So there's the shape of the trolley wire, and basically it has the shape so you have some little pinchers that can hold the wire like this, okay? But it was supposed to be made originally from a casting of very high purity copper silver alloy. This only has a tenth of a percent silver, so leave it for me. I can still use it. It doesn't have, it's not worth much. Um, but it has a particular structure. You'll look at the grain structure here. This is just a long longitudinal section. And so you have geometry, which is shape. You also have uh, a microstructure of the material that imparts part of the function or the strength of the material and things. And all of that has to be done at a reasonable cost. And we'll talk about reasonable cost. Um, actually, I'll hand it out later. Uh, but I have a, hand, a handout that, that I wrote um, looking at structural materials and what do we mean by cost. Um, but just to give you a hint, anybody have an idea what uh, the cost of a pound, of, uh, well, the cost of steel per ton. What's the current cost of steel per ton? Well, there's lots of different types of steels. First question you should ask me, what type of steel? Okay. Mild steel. Mild steel. Okay, that's a good choice. Mild steel in just a simple bulk form like plate. Well, not, plate's not a good example. It has to have a reasonable quality. Yeah. But a simple bar or wire or something, mild steel might be $500 a ton, or rebar, concrete reinforcing bar, okay? Cheapest steel there is. It's not always mild steel, it's actually medium carbon steel, but cheapest there is, today is probably going for four or $500 a ton. Well, that turns out to 20 to 25 cents a pound, okay? Um, cheaper than the bottled water per pound, okay? Interesting thought, isn't it? 
Uh, yeah. Are you saying mild steel or mild steel? Mild, M-I-L-D. They call it mild steel. They really mean low carbon steel. But the, the typical term among the, the guys in the shop is mild steel. Okay? That's what they call it. They mean low carbon steel. They mean a steel that's readily weldable. It has no alloying elements and things like that. You don't have to get too detailed. You'll, you'll have a hard time catching up on all, all my notes. But anyway, you know. Okay, it's just, okay. But it's mild, okay? Well, uh, so if I'm trying to impart geometry function and, and all at a reasonable cost to my material, it turns out materials manufacturing is in fact a function of a number of things. And if you, you will learn that <coughs> if you don't already speak MITEs, um, focusing very well anyway um, so materials manufacturing is a function and you put in parentheses of all these things time geometry cost structure composition materials manufacturing a function of time when I first bought my house actually just before I bought my house in their late 70s still live in that same house um, I got a job as an assistant while well, I was an assistant professor consulting for a firm down here in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Mike's been there, okay? These people make that you got that continuously cast bar of copper. They would do that in 14 karat gold. This firm makes probably 30, 40% of the gold stock used by jewelers in the United States. It's, this firm is the reason Attleboro is known as the gold capital of the world. A lot of the jewelry in the world comes out of Attleboro. If you want to see something else of more complex geometry, they used to make the, the gold alloys that other people down there would turn into MIT class rings. That's a big, a big version of a class, MIT class ring, which is called a brass rat. Anyone ever seen a brass rat? I'm not wearing my brass rat right now, but, but uh, uh, you all can, when you get ready to graduate, you can wear a brass rat. It's very distinctive. It's actually a gold beaver, but we call it a brass rat. And that is made by casting to impart a very complex geometry, okay? Well, this company down in Attleboro, they would start out with gold bullion, and they would alloy it in their foundry, in their casting shop. And they, they had ingot casting, they had, con they had two continuous casting machines. So just like that bar of copper, they were making carat gold plates, bars, and things by continuous casting. They then would roll it down, clad it to make filled gold, they would make wire, they would extrude it. Virtually every manufa materials manufacturing shaping forming was done in that one plant down in Attleboro, and still is, okay? However, I learned in that business, no one cared about what it cost to actually shape it. They only cared about how long it took. Because in that case, all the cost was the interest cost on the gold. It was more valuable than all the processing costs. If I can make steel for 25 cents a you know, a, a pound, which is cheaper than bottled water, then the materials manufacturing cost is not very significant, but you start figuring at, you know, at that back in those days it was only six, seven, eight hundred dollars an ounce, okay? But you start figuring, you know, casting a million ounces at eight hundred dollars an ounce, okay? Not a million ounces, 100,000 ounces. So anyway, I would go down there and there would be millions of dollars in the pot, okay? And so they had, to, they had to do it as quickly as possible. And a lot of that bullion made it from start to finish in the plant in three, three days, okay? It wasn't there very long before it came out as a finished product. So sometimes it's a function of time, sometimes geometry, sometimes some other cost, the cost of the material. Uh, stainless steels can have a much higher cost. In fact, I actually should have something over here <coughs> that tells us relative cost. This is a book on bolting. You know, I was looking at it earlier this morning. I realized that's, you'll find this is one of the reasons I use this 
silly little projector because I don't know what I'm going to talk about today exactly but this is <coughs> approximate relative cost of fastener materials so medium carbon steel mild steel if it has a relative cost of one okay stainless steels will be two and a half times that austenitic iron base these are super duper steels okay things like the navy wants to build a stainless steel submarine okay 12 times the cost of mild steel now you have to understand that hy100 that they're building submarines out of right now has not a unit cost it has maybe 1.5 1.8 times mild steel maybe even two times mild steel but it's not 12 times mild steel the new austenitic alloys for the non-magnetic submarine will be in this 12 times the cost okay nickel copper alloys whatever ship you're on now how many of you came out of the shipyard okay a couple of you they're using lots of monel now right in copper nickel alloys particularly in the piping I mean even if you're aboard ship you probably are a newer ship it's not it's not mild steel piping anymore Mild steel piping was just going to corrode in 20 years, and the ship's supposed to have a 30-year life. Now ships are supposed to have 50-year lives, and so they've decided it's cost-effective to make the piping out of something better that will last the life of the ship, rather than having to replace all the piping in the ship after 20 years. Uh, any of you on one of the old ships that had carbon steel piping that you were constantly repairing, right? And inspecting, okay? But it gives some of the enlisted men something to do, and the junior officers gives them a lot to do. Anyway, okay, titanium, 75 times, okay? In the old day, I remember I was involved in some of the early titanium submarine stuff, okay? My first research contract was on titanium, welding of heavy section titanium for the Navy. Uh, austenitic nickel-based alloys, things like Inconels, your nuclear reactor materials and stuff, 100 times the cost. So we got two orders of magnitude difference in cost of metals. This is just for fasteners. It could be a little bit greater in other cases, but those are kind of the relative costs we're going to be dealing with. And so a significant thing that we're talking when we're talking about imparting ge um, geometry function and shape and function and our shape function and at reasonable cost, time geometry cost structure. You saw all those grains in that copper I sent around. Composition, quality control. Typically, quality control can equal all your fabrication costs. Okay? Nowadays, because we get better and better techniques. It's just like medical um, diagnostics. Okay? Why, why is the cost of medical uh, or medicine going up? One of the reasons is that we have all these quality control things. They can do all kinds of diagnostic tests. In the old days, they'd x-ray your arm, now they'll give you an MRI at about 40 times the cost of an x-ray, okay? Because it, an MRI tells the doctor more and protects his liability. You know, never mind, we won't get into that. Codes and standards many times are the limiting thing in materials manufacturing, particularly in the pressure vessel industry. The code puts severe limitations on any innovation that anyone wants to do. If you're in the nuclear business, it's very hard to come up with a better material for that reactor vessel, okay? Because you need to do about a billion dollars worth of testing to qualify a new material, okay? Um, the environment, health, resources, politics, I put religion down here too. And what I was thinking of at the time is Professor Hostler here uh, wrote what was basically her doctoral thesis on a book called The Signs, Sounds and Color of Power. I would have brought a copy, but I loaned it to somebody and they kept it on the no return plan. Okay. Um, but she wrote a book called The Sounds and Color of Power, where people in middle America, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, used gold and copper and made little bells out of them and it really got down to kind of religious spiritual things okay so people were she had a actually I think Mike took the seminar years ago when he was a freshman where she had this 
we, she and I taught it together. I was the new department head and she was a, a young faculty member. And uh, her thesis was that materials were developed through the ages because of um, religious symbolism and, and such things. And my thesis was most materials have been developed for military purposes. Okay, military is kind of the leader in the technology. That was the, the conflict we put before the students. Okay, and really it probably just depends on what age you're talking about or what culture you're talking about. But materials manufacturing relates to lots of different things. And so here's an article by Norm Augustine called Socioengineering. Norm Augustine used to be on the MIT Corporation, one of the few MIT, non-MIT grads ever to make it to the MIT Corporation. He was an engineer at Martin Marietta, wrote a book called Augustine's Laws, where he looked at trends. He's, he's a strategic thinker, basically. And um, anyway, he gave this as a commencement talk at University of Colorado in 1993. And he talks about the ages of engineering and how society has gone through lots of different things over time. And he says we're now in the age of socio-engineering where a lot of the decisions are not made for technical reasons, they're made for socio-political economic reasons. Think of, you know, right now a number of communities are trying to outlaw bottled water, right? because it's that wasted plastic at the end. It's not environmentally sound, right? Um, my lab is going, undergoing a, just had asbestos remediation. This room already had asbestos remediation, but most of MIT, the old MIT buildings here, the top, the ceiling tiles were asbestos, the floor tiles are asbestos. So we were surrounded by asbestos, and now they're coming in at costs of $100 a square foot to get rid of the asbestos, right? Or more. Yeah, it depends on. But if you clear out everything out of the room, and they, they came in, and they did it in a week, okay? Working all the way through the night, so when other people wouldn't be around and things. So I want to talk now um, about, give you a case study. And this is, we'll, we will get to some technical things a little bit later today. I want to talk about the history of nails, okay? Nails have been around for thousands of years. The Romans forged nails by hand, okay? And here are some forged and cut nails made by a little firm here, in Mass still in Massachusetts, still doing it. Some of it's the old-fashioned way, but I bet you they have some machines. But the reason I want to tell you about nails is because it sort of gives you a history of where materials manufacturing has been and where it's come. It turns out, <coughs> and I could show you a video if I was, didn't have time to prepare a lecture, there's a book or a series of PBS articles basically on metallurgy. It's, they wrote a book on it, it's called Out of the Fiery Furnace, I think this goes back about 20 years. Uh, what is this? Oh, 25 years, 1986. Pennsylvania State University Press. Okay, the impact of metals on the history of mankind. Okay. Well, it turns out um, that there were some actually very interesting things going on in England in the 1500s. And let's see if I can, well actually, my notes will give me a better a better version of this, or an easier one to read you some of the history. Okay. But there is, there's actually a whole series of like 12 hours of lectures about the history of metallurgy in, in the world. Um, and it says, uh, It's talking about the problem of trees and iron making. Iron making required charcoal back in the 1500s. Okay, they didn't they hadn't started using coal 
they would take trees and turn them into charcoal. Anybody know how you make charcoal from trees? Burn it in an oxygen poor environment. So you, you fell the trees, make a big, big, big pile that would be a bonfire, then you, pour, you put dirt over that and then you just limit the amount of oxygen that can get in there. You start the fire in this chamber like a brick kiln almost and you're limiting the amount of oxygen so as the thing heats up in this oven you're burning off all the volatiles all the lignin and other things in that wood go off and you're left with charcoal which is basically carbon and it's the charcoal is relatively strong compared to the wood it doesn't give off a bunch of smoke because you've smoked it out okay you've gotten rid of it and charcoal they had found was the way to make iron Okay, and so they were cutting trees all over England because they had found, let's see, um, let's see, the earliest known water powered blast furnace in Europe began operating in Italy in 1463. Okay, before that, they would make cannons out of brass or bronze, but brass and bronze are about two or three times as expensive as steel, and so when they learned to melt cast iron in a blast furnace they could make cheaper weapons so I'm now proving my thesis over Professor Hostler's thesis that it was military technology but in any case um, from that time onwards the new technology spread rapidly especially, especially when it's found that cannons could be cast from iron instead of bronze which was expensive okay and the problem was over the next 50, 60 years, the trees, the trees in England were being felled with greater and greater rapidity. And it turns out, um, it says the Weld of Kent, W-A-L-D, of Kent was densely forested with mature oaks, beech, and chestnut. Now, um, they stood on chalk, and on that chalk, beginning in Roman times, they had found, people had found rich pockets of iron. So they had iron ore, and they had trees for coal and the chalk itself was the the flux they needed for the melting they had everything they needed and so they started cutting trees okay um, but then they had a problem because the great oaks were what they built the man of war with okay in fact why is old ironside called old ironsides called old ironsides the Constitution. This is the oldest ship in your Navy, guys. Yeah. Well, three cannonballs would bounce off. So. Right, but why was it stronger than the British ships, which were also made of oak? Different oak. Very good. What was the oak? Do you know? It was Carolina live oak. Okay, and there is now a society to preserve the Carolina live oak because it's stronger than any other oak in the world, apparently, and. That's how they can, uh, uh, that's why old Ironsides survived and they said the cannons just bounced off because it was the strongest wood, okay? Um, for the HMS Victory for Alfred the Great, Nelson, uh, no, v Nelson's flagship took 2,000, uh, well she weighed 2,100 tons of oak. It took a whole forest to build Victory, okay? So the two uses, uses of oak, oak were in conflict, and now a third industry was glass making. And to make glass, you also need charcoal. Because you can't get all those impurities in the glass or you end up with a mess. And so it said, in 1558 a law was passed forbidding the felling of trees to make coal for the burning of iron. iron. But as with all politics, they excluded the forest of Kent and Sussex where it really would do any good, okay? So it's like saying you can, you're forbidden to grow corn anywhere but Iowa. You know, I mean, huh? you can still do it. Good old politicians, even back then, okay? And then they, uh, um, the price, in 1559 a writer complained the price of wood had ri risen from a penny to two shillings. I don't remember what the conversion is between pennies and shillings, but anyway, I think it's more than a factor of 10. I think it's 14 or 28 or something. 
Anyway, by 1581, the shortage of wood for shipbuilding was so serious that a further act was passed forbidding the felling of trees within 22 miles of the Thames River, within four miles of the Great Forest of the Weld, and within three miles of the coastline anywhere. By 1615, England was facing an energy crisis. So here was the first energy crisis. Probably wasn't the first energy crisis, but it was an energy crisis. Okay? A royal proclamation in that year lamented the disappearance of the kind of wood which is not only great and large in height and bulk, but hath also that toughness and heart, as it is not subject to rive or cleave, and therefore of excellent use for shipping. Okay? So again, military technology. Um, 1615, what, uh, what had happened, what colony had the Brits founded back in the days around 1615? Anyone ever heard of Plymouth Plantation here in New England or Jamestown in Virginia? That was the early 1600s, right? If you go to Jamestown today, what technology, anyone ever visited Jamestown? So what do they have there for a technology exhibit? They, they do like yeah, but they also have a glass furnace shop. Jamestown had a glass making shop. Because they didn't have any trees in England anymore, we had lots of trees over here, and they could make charcoal over here. What did they have in New England? They had Saugus Ironworks, and so if you look at the beginnings of the foundry industry in, you know, it's not very good focus, I don't know, I have to find out what's wrong with the focus on this thing. Um, but the foundry industry in, this should be, oh this is, uh, this is Jamestown, this is Chesapeake Bay, and here's Jamestown and, and there are various things around here, we'll see in the next page. Um, No, forget it. That, I, I thought I was going to show you something on Saugus. But if you go up here to Saugus, Massachusetts, it was the first ironworks in the United States. Okay? And they have a blast furnace up there. At that time, it took approximately, I estimate, one person year per ton of iron. If you figure a person year back then was 3,000 hours, because they probably worked at least 60 hours a week, six, 10 hour days. You know, they didn't work on the Sabbath, but they probably worked more than eight hours a day during the week. And what did they have to do? They had to chop down the trees, make charcoal, put it in a blast furnace, cast the pig iron. Why is it called pig iron? Because if you go up there to Saugus, and this would be a good place to take a little field trip, take your kids, your spouses. It's a national park now, right now, um, so it doesn't cost anything. Um, but you go up there, and they will show you how the bottom of the blast furnace, and we'll show you what a blast furnace looks like later. It's just a big column, but at the bottom you tap a hole, and the molten iron comes running out onto the sand floor. And as it runs, you actually the guys had, would dig a trough in the sand, so when the water, not the water, the, the molten metal cast iron comes out, it would run down this trough into a... <coughs> so here's a little trough, and it would come down into a manifold, and off the manifold would be other little troughs, so the liquid comes down here, fills up this manifold, and fills up each one of these little things. And these were like the pigs on the sow. And this was called a sow bar. It weighed four or five hundred pounds. The pigs only weighed a hundred or two hundred pounds. But this was like the, the suckling pigs on the sow. And the sow bar might be what you turn into cannon. Okay and you had to have lots of men just to even move that and the pigs were what you would make things like nails out of and to make nails you basically hand forged them or you could roll them into sheet or things you look at most of those nails they're either hand forged uh, that thing I sent around or they're cut from sheet they didn't really have a lot of wire drawing technology back then okay 
They had a little bit, but, but not much. And so as a result, nails were very expensive. They would burn down an old building and sift through the ashes to recover the nails to reuse them, to recycle them. Can you imagine doing that today? Why? Because nails are among the cheapest of our wire products right now. Today it takes one half hour or less per man to make a ton of steel. So we've seen a productivity increase, this materials manufacturing being a function of time, materials composition. Over the last 400 years, we've had a 6,000 fold increase. That's a 600 thousand percent improvement in productivity to make steel. Not bad, huh? And we still see how those things change. In my lifetime, when I worked for Bethlehem Steel 35 years ago, half the cost of making steel was labor. Bethlehem Steel, second, second largest steel company in the world, 45 percent of their costs were materials, limestone, iron ore, coal, 45% was labor and 10% was profit. And today it's 95% is materials, 10% is labor and negative 5% is profit. Okay, Or whatever it is. Actually it's changed a little bit in recent years because the Chinese have started using so much metal. But what happened is well, one of the things that happened, again, in my lifetime, and we'll talk about this, is they went from ingot casting to continuous casting. And in the old ingot casting technology, one-third of your steel you had to recycle. You had to cut off the tops of the ingots, okay? If you have one of the, here you had pig iron ingots, but even in steel mills of the 1960s, You'd have a big mold like this, and you'd cast the steel in here, and you actually would have to cut off the top third because of shrinkage. And one of the th numbers we always had to worry about at Bethlehem Steel was trying to improve the yield. The yield was at about 65% overall for the whole corporation, which meant for every 100 pounds of steel you poured, you only could ship 65 pounds. When they went to continuous casting, which was being developed in the 1960s and really came into its own where almost all steel by the 1980s was continuous cast, this number went up to 95 to 97%. Today it's at about 98%. Okay, Because with continuous casting there's no top shrinkage you just cut off the bar, I mean of course the bar could be a big bar, okay? Cut off the bar and there's the shrinkage is only at the beginning and the end and a good continuous cast nowadays starts and then doesn't stop for a week or maybe two. They cast continuously for one or two weeks. So there's not all this wasted material, okay? So that was a dramatic increase in productivity. Another increase in productivity in the steel industry, and we'll talk about this later, maybe tomorrow. They went from open hearth furnaces, where to make three or 400 tons of steel, it took you 24 hours to refine the steel, to burn all that carbon out of the cast iron and stuff. And in the 1960s, actually late 50s in Lutz, Austria, someone found they could blow pure oxygen into the steel bath and per, pure oxygen will burn carbon faster than air. Anybody know that? Okay. But to do it in a 300 ton bath is a little more exciting. Okay. And so now they can burn the carbon out of iron not in 24 hours in an open hearth but in a basic oxygen furnace they can do it in 20 minutes with a supersonic jet of oxygen. And so the vast majority of the uh, pure oxygen in the world is used to make steel. They just blow a supersonic jet about this big around of pure oxygen into the steel bath of 300 tons of steel. Really exciting. Anyone ever been to a steel plant and seen a BOF in operation? You want to see fireworks. It's really neat. 
Okay, why don't we take a, about a five or ten minute break? Be back here by seven or eight forty. Okay. So everybody know where the restrooms are. You got a, this glass blower named Blaschka. Okay, and Blaschka was making little colored replicas of sea urchins. I mean, people bring back these little sea animals. He'd look at them in the microscope or whatever, and he would do a, a model of this in blown glass. And someone said, well, can you try to do a flower? And so he did, and he shipped it across the Atlantic, and it kind of came across, and it was broken. But they could still tell there was a lot of promise to this. So some rich, rich, rich woman in the... I'm stuttering more. I lost a tooth, okay, over here. I'm going to have an implant. But anyway... So anyway, some rich woman over here in the back bay um, gives a bunch of money to Harvard and they brought Mr. Blaschka over from Prussia. And for the next 60 years, he and his son would take plants like a cashew plant from Brazil or India or wherever and they would copy it in glass in full color. And they would also put it in the microscope and they'd show you whether it's a monocotyledon or a dicotyledon. And so this is sort of scientific exhibit and art exhibit and everything else all at once. One of the things they didn't do was all the material science to necessary to know whether the glasses were going to be stable over the next hundred years or whether they would decompose. So apparently only about 30% of them are still on display. But, and now, when I started out, they were free. The Peabody Museum was free. Then they started charging 25 cents to get in. And I think now it's up to like 10 bucks a head or something to get I into the Peabody. Is it? Okay, fine. Okay. Good. Uh, then you qualify. Um, but you're only still only going to see about 30%. Now, the other interesting thing is in the 1930s, it turns out his son, after the original Blasha had pa passed away, apparently started getting interested in diseased fruit. So you can go in and you can see a, a pear on, on a branch and it's all shriveled with fungus and you know, it's really neat. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, so that's the glass flowers. And we ought to, well, another thing is, where is the blue silhouette of Ho Chi Minh? The what? The blue silhouette of Ho Chi Minh. So, at the time of the Vietnam War, in the late 60s, there was a art sculpture, very prominent here in the Boston area, still can be seen, and the, the woman who painted this sculpture was named Corita. She was a former nun, Catholic nun, and she had left the novi novitiate or whatever, and she did this piece of artwork, and she was a North Vietnamese sympathizer. And so in this artwork, there is a 40 foot tall blue silhouette of Ho Chi Minh. Now unfortunately, the structure this was on was taken down, but there was another structure similar to it. And when they repainted it, it's still sort of there. But you have to know to look at it. But I remember when they tore the original one down, they had a picture and, well actually I'll tell you, I'll tell you where it is. I used to try to force the freshmen to go find out these things. As you come up the Southeast Distress Way here in Boston, anybody have to commute up from Brockton or anything? Yeah, okay. Uh, Mike does. He lives down in Brockton. No one's down at South Weymouth? Weymouth Naval Air Station? The old, anyway, we used to have a lot of students here who would live down in naval housing down there. Um, as you come up, there were used to be two big white gas tanks right at, as you get to uh, Savin Hill okay they tore one of them down but the original one had these the rainbow of colors it was like big paint stripes on this white tank and in the 80s. And, uh, in the 80s well they were there in the 60s when I came as a freshman in 68 they were there and Corita had the blue one prominent 40 foot tall as you're coming up the Southeast Expressway there's the silhouette of Ho Chi Minh <laughs> Okay, and every time they repainted the tanks, they'd sort of make it a little fuzzier. Okay, and finally, when they tore the tanks down, it's still there, but it's really fuzzy now. Okay, but if you went back to when they tore the tank down on the front page of the Boston Globe, they had a picture of the old tank and the new tank, and they showed how they had 
they had been getting rid of. But the original silhouette was absolutely, I used to call it Ho Chi Minh on a stick, okay? Because it you know, had a long kind of tapering neck. It was just, it was part of a big stripe of, of uh, blue color. But the tank still, I mean, I assume it still does, I haven't been paid much attention to it, but they still have the artwork, Karita's artwork, which is a rainbow of about five colored stripes, about 20 feet wide stripe, like some, someone took a, you know, the Jolly Green Giant took a paintbrush and put a rainbow of colors on there. The blue one is Ho Chi Minh on the, on the side, okay, not on the top. But it was very prominent. It was right at you. Anyway. Um, the other thing I used to give the students was uh, um, where can you find Mrs. Hawthorne's poem that she scratched on the windowsill with her diamond ring, her wedding ring, a poem for her two-year-old daughter as she looked out the window um, after an ice storm and her little daughter, she talked, the poem basically talks about the glass, sh her little daughter looking out the window and how the trees look like glass chandeliers, okay? Mrs. Hawthorne was also quite a quite literary, just like her husband. I'll tell you that if you look out that window, you can almost see the old North Bridge. You know, where the shot heard around the world was, right? You know, and all that stuff. So anyway, um, that does cost five bucks to get in that house. But anyway, uh, so there are some things to see in Boston, okay? Uh, and actually, some of the best things are not in Boston. I don't care much for Plymouth Plantation anymore. I haven't been there for 30 years, so I guess it's not fair to say. Uh, but I just took uh, some of my, uh, one of my children and grandchildren out to Sturbridge Village uh, a couple of weeks ago, which is an hour west of Boston, which is a, supposed to be like a 1790 to 1820 recreation of a New, New England village. And they've got a, a sawmill and a carding mill and a blacksmith shop. Actually, they like the blacksmith shop better than anything. A farm with animals. So anyway, there are some things to see in Boston, okay? And of course, there's always the Freedom Trail and stuff like that. Okay, so let's get back to, to things. Um, before I get into the technical stuff of, of fasteners, you, you're taping now? Okay. Um, those nails came from the Trayman Nail Company, and so if you, which was established in 1819. It's down here in Mansfield, Massachusetts. Now, I've never been to the Trayman Nail Company, but I have been to Mansfield. In 1830, they started a chocolate factory down there. And uh, unfortunately, they closed it a year ago. But for the last 10 years, I've been getting a couple hundred pounds of chocolate um, from the chocolate factory because I've consulted with them. And I, I get the couple hundred pounds, not for me, but for the Boy Scouts who turn it into $6,000 by making fudge each year. Uh, so far as bullseye glass, what is bullseye glass? Anybody know? If you've ever, yeah. Uh, no, it's not. Or is it a crown plate? It is a spun out plate. So if you, if you Google, it says in your notes, try Googling uh, bullseye glass. But bullseye glass, yeah, I don't know if this is going to work. No, it's not going to work. Uh, um, there's bullseye glass right above that door. And what happened, bullseye glass, Oh, here's a better picture of bullseye glass. Sugar hollow glass, which is somewhere in New York State. That's bullseye glass. And it's made, this guy is, if you go down here when you, when you do the, the blacksmith tour, you're going to see right across the other side of the room, which is problematic anyway, but the, with, they have a departmental glass blowing facility. And so they put glass, hot glass on a, on a stick and then they shape it and form it with tools. You'll see the same thing in Corning, New York. But basically, bullseye glass was the way they made glass plate or glass windows back in the days of the mill master at Saugus Ironworks, you know, in the 1620s and 1630s. You basically would 
Let's come down on this. But you would start out with your blob of molten glass on a, on a metal pipe because you're going to want to be able to blow through the pipe to blow a bubble in this hot glass. You then flatten the end with one of these metal tools while you're spinning it. You'll see a little table down there. Mike can tell you about the table made by Professor Seema at home. He likes to do woodworking. They would then cut a hole in it, put it back in the, uh, in the oven, the furnace, to soften it again, and then spin it into a disc. And they would cut out the little window panes as squares from the flat disc. But the bullseye was the thing that was left over that had been connected to the pipe. And the difference in, in the old days, bullseye glass was not taxed because it was considered junk. It was scrap. It was not pretty. And the only people who could afford, well, the people, the people who could afford good glass for the window panes were the wealthy people. And the poor people would buy the bullseye glass because it was cheaper, it wasn't taxed, and they would put it above their doors, okay, just to let light in. If you go to the old manse, which is the building where Mrs. Hawthorne wrote, you know, scratched the stuff in the windows with her diamond ring, you will see, um, I think they have bullseye glass above the window there. If you go to Williamsburg, Virginia, or Jamestown, they will probably tell you about bullseye glass. So in the old days, bullseye glass was the cheap stuff that the poor people who could afford any glass would buy. Today, if you go to Sugar Hollow, you buy a little piece of bullseye for 100 bucks a pane. It's the premium stuff. Because you want to pretend like you're poor when you're really rich. I guess. I don't know. Don't ask me the logic of all this. Okay. But it is handmade. Uh, the, uh, just to give you an idea of materials manufacturing and where it's come, since I'm kind of giving you a history of things, in the um, glass got to be a little more sophisticated in the 1800s rather than just kind of a little hand job and making a little disc that you could cut out little window panes. And that's why windows, old windows, were, were never big panes of glass. They were because they were made from just spinning this little thing and cutting it by hand. They actually got to the point where they could take big glass melting furnaces and they could pull out whole sheets of glass. Hot glass is sort of interesting. It can flow like taffy and it can, you can stretch it out. And they got to the point where they could pull out six foot wide sheets of glass. And at the turn of the century of the 20th, beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century, there was Pittsburgh Plate Glass had a building that supposedly was a mile long beside one of the rivers in Pittsburgh. And they would have this glass melting furnace and they would pull the glass out, they'd let it cool, they'd have to put it through an annealing furnace because the glass will develop residual, residual stresses and can fracture very easily until you anneal it. And then the greatest length was because they then had to polish it because it wasn't very smooth. And if you go look at old buildings from the 1880s and 1890s, you can tell which were the original panes of glass because the original panes of glass have got all kinds of waves on them. In fact, I can go out here at MIT in my office, okay, and you can look and see which panes of glass might have been original in 1917 when these buildings were built, or 1916, because they're not as flat, okay? But around, I don't remember when, um, around the early part of the 20th century, the Pilkington Company in England developed the Pilkington process for float glass. And the float glass process still would pull out this sheet of glass, but instead of putting it on a table to cool and then go into the annealing furnace, they would pull it out onto a bath of molten tin. Tin melts at around 400 C, but the other good thing about tin is it doesn't vaporize until about 2000 C. It's got a very high vapor, a very low vapor pressure. Anyway, 
they would pull it out and the glass would anneal on this molten tin and it would the top surface would just smooth out by gravity and the bottom surface would be smooth because it's on top of this bath of molten tin. That's the float glass process. Everything that's in your house today is made by the float glass process. Instead of having a PPG building that goes for a mile in Pittsburgh, they now have buildings that may go for, I've been through a float glass process uh, uh, in Ohio where they make automobile windshields and it might be 150, 200 yards long. It's not, not, it's a big building, but it's not huge, okay? The actual melting furnace is maybe twice the size of this room, okay? For the hot furnace. And then the annealing part of it is probably a similar thing. It's all continuous. It's continuously pulling out glass, feeding glass in the other end, melting it, and then pulling it out, floating it on the tin. No more polishing of the plate glass. And it's very flat, very clear, okay. Not clear if you don't wash the windows like we have at MIT, but anyway. Um, but it's still nice and clear. However, the top surface is better than the bottom surface. Because the top surface is just floating in air and gravity makes it smooth. That computer right there has a glass screen, right? That screen is made, and I can only tell you a little bit about this, because I had to sign a confidentiality to go through this plant. But it's made by the float glass process, and the furnace is actually no bigger than this room, and it's actually not anywhere near as wide. And they pull out strips of this glass from the melting furnace, and they put it through a little, and I don't remember how wide, in fact, I'm not sure I ever even saw without the cover on that, but it's not very wide to make whatever whatever the narrow dimension of a TV screen is, okay? And then, and so it's got the, the air surface and it's got the tin surface, and then they split it in two, and they drop it and re-weld it basically by putting the two hot pieces so the two tin surfaces are welded together on the inside. Two pieces of bread coming together with no peanut butter in the middle. Okay, and now you have a float glass surface on each surface. Each free surface is now a float glass surface. And that's how they make something very thin. And in fact, as it falls by gravity for several floors, I mean several stories, okay, this is in a tall building, it's falling by gravity through furnaces that control the temperature so it just slowly thins down and stretches out like silly putty. And they end up with something that's only 15 or 20 thousandths thick, but has two air surfaces of float glass. Very profitable business, okay? Start with sand, end up with the computer, you know, the outside surface of a computer screen. But they really control that technology. I mean, I've been through a number of military facilities and let me tell you, you guys don't know anything about security until you've been through a, a computer screen plant, okay? Actually, I know you know a lot about security if you start dealing with these nuclear materials, but I tend to try not to go through one of those facilities, okay? I wouldn't say I haven't ever been through one, but I avoid them. They make me nervous. What makes me nervous about those types of facilities is the guards have automatic weapons and they're standing there and the safeties are off and their fingers are on the trigger, okay? And their orders are to shoot first and ask questions later. So, I just don't even want to be around them. <laughs> okay, but anyway, that's another story. Um, okay, so that's how glass has gone from a hand art where bullseye was the cheap stuff to now it's still a hand art making bullseye and selling it for 100 bucks a pane. But float glass has shrunk plants from a mile long to a couple of hundred yards. And then when you really want to be precise for TV screens or computer screens, you get even fancier. And so pretty interesting technology to 
when you think about some of those things. Okay, um, now let's talk a little bit about, since I'm on fasteners, and I hardly ever covered fasteners in earlier days. You've seen the nails, and we talked about the productivity increase with nails. But let's talk a little bit about, well, I can talk a little bit about fasteners right now. Uh, there are a bunch of fasteners in the world. So I went to Home Depot and I bought different fasteners. What's this? It's like a safety pin. A safety pin, it's a cotter pin. It's a different type of cotter pin. Um, here's the regular type of cotter pin you're familiar with, right? But in the same things, this, is, this one's sort of, but it's just like a safety pin, you know, operates the same way. It just locks on rather than bending it. Um, here's another one, okay, that slips on and locks sort of. Um, there are washers that come in all kinds of sh sizes and shapes. That's a fender washer. Here's a lock washer. I mean, you guys have seen these types of things. Here's a bolt for hanging things in the wall, you know, where things spr springs out. Um, there are plastic bolts. This is the latest and greatest for going into gypsum board. You have big threads, you drill a hole, screw this in, and then if you want a metal screw, you screw the metal screw in that, right? So there are tens of millions of different types of metal fasteners, okay? And somewhere in here, where am I? Oh, when we get to nails, you know, we don't use nails anywhere as much as we used to. We still use nails, and I have some nails here, but to find an uncoated steel nail, here's one, okay, and they're four penny nails, six penny nails, I can't remember, I looked up what penny means, but it has so many, so many weights per, per pound of nails or something, I don't remember. Um, but many of them are coated. Actually, I guess we can pass these around if you want. One, these are similar nails, but one of them's got a, uh, a coating on it. Now, anyone ever used resin coated nails? Yeah. Why do you use them? Yeah, it melts the resin from the friction, and you ever try to pull one out with a claw hammer? You'll, you'll break the wood before you get that nail out, okay? Now, when I used to do Cub Scouts when my sons were that age, um, one of the things in the, in the wolf book is to have them drive a screw. And I remember the first time I had the Scouts do, do that, none of them, unless I made the hole really bigger than it should have been, uh, could really drive that screw without stripping the threads, the heads. And of course, you know, you could, you could use a Phillips head, which is not a, you know, not as easy to strip as a, a flathead screw. But now we got torques and things like that that make assembly easier. But the way I found that I would drilled all these holes the proper size to screw them in, but these seven and eight year old boys were still stripping the, the heads. So what's the solution? Without my going and getting, finding the right drill and drilling them out to where it was really not screwing in at all, just kind of twisting something in. I went and got a bar of soap. Right? So you can use resin coated nails so that you lock them in place with a coating. Or if you're drilling, if you're pushing, trying to get a screw in there and it's twisting too hard, you lubricate it. Soap's not a bad lubricant. And then the, the kids could, could do it just fine. So I learned how to do that. Here are nails. I can't remember what type these are. These are zinc coated, but they got a uh, twist to them. And so when they go in, they twist and it helps lock them in. I think they're deck nails or something. Is that right, Matt? Okay. I think they are. Here's a, uh, here's a nail that's very lightweight. Right? You know what material that's made out of? It's called aluminum. I was going to say galvanum. No, that was, that's aluminum. That's even lighter than galvanized. Um, this, I think, is a galvanized nail. Uh, certainly the, the twisted nail was a galvanized nail. Um, and here's a, here's a coated screw. This is a deck screw. No, that's a deck screw. Uh, and it's coated for similar types of reason, reasons. But we've gotten more and more sophisticated. It's not 
just some blacksmith hammering them into shape. But even the blacksmith hammering them into shape, one of the reasons to show you this, is people get very sophisticated. Some of them have little, little bulges on the surface. That so when it goes into the wood, it won't pull out as easily because it expands beneath the surface. I mean, expand the wood; it has to expand beneath the surface, and because the wood will creep back with the moisture, uh, it essentially locks it in, and it doesn't come loose as easily. So people do all kinds of things to try to improve things. Uh, what do I have in here? Nylon screws, very corrosion resistant in most things, but not in everything. Um, this is an, another blue coated. Um, anyway, um, so there's lots of, there's <coughs> expensive bolts. So this is a high strength Allen head bolt, sometimes called a cap screw. You often find it in good expensive machinery equipment. It's just a very high strength uh, steel bolt um, that you use an Allen wrench for. Um, this is the heaviest bolt I have. This is called a more grip bolt. Any of you ever heard of more grip bolts? M-O-R-G-R-I-P. They're used to hold the flutes of the propellers on ships. Okay? And it's a little different. It's got a hex head. And um, actually, I didn't take this one off. This one may actually, it's got an Allen head in the center here. And I think that's because it actually has a hole right down the center. Anyone ever used a bolt that had a hole down the center? I wonder what the, the hole's for. What's it for? Uh, well, they use like an ultrasonic tool, which uh, as you uh, tighten it, you know, the bolt actually stretches. Right, the bolt down. stretches as you pull on it. And? Oh, there has to be a specific uh, amount of like space between the end of the hole right. and, and your actual tool. Right, because... Most of the time, you know, the scouts is just, they just torqued it until it got in, right? And it, the, the screw was done when it got into the wood. <clears throat> and as long as they're close to getting it all the way in, I gave them credit. Okay. But if you're building a, a nuclear reactor or something, you're probably going to make sure people torque the bolts. Or actually, if you're just working on a car, they ought to use a torque wrench, right, on the bolts. Because you can, uh, the worst, well, Bolts have a problem if you under torque them or if you over torque them. Okay, what happens if you under torque them? They don't have as much clamp and they can come loose. What happens if you over torque them? They'll too much stress and they can fatigue and then they can become really loose. They break. Okay, so it turns out when you have a critical application, a really critical application, not some lousy little thing like a nuclear reactor. Okay, but when you have something like an aircraft engine, okay, you actually measure bolt stretch rather than bolt torque. Because if you measure torque, it all depends on the friction on the bolt. And it depends on, the friction coefficient depends on whether it's lubricated or not lubricated on the threads. It also depends on how well the threads are cut. So we talk about the class of threads, class A, class B, and class C. And that has to be how clo closely the male threads meet the female threads, okay? Class, or maybe not A, B, and C, it's one, two, and three. And class two is a good bolt, like one of these. Class three, I think, is the highest. Class one is garbage, okay? Um, but um, a very sophisticated bolt will actually have a shank that is a smaller diameter than the threads so that you actually have solid metal all the way down. You don't thin it down where the threads are, okay? Because if you start doing a stress analysis on this, you'll get a more uniform stress if you actually have the shank a smaller diameter. Um, you also take this out and you said, you're right, they often put a little ultrasonic thing in there and they can measure the stretch. They also sometimes just put a, a um, rod down there and they measure the length of the of the hole okay not on this one but you're right yes the application i uh it was experienced in was uh when i was on the dive side with some navy divers that were replacing some blades on the propeller hub so right they were that's the tool they were using 
if you're diving, it'd be a lot easier to use an ultrasonic tool than it would be to you get in there with a little micrometer trying to measure something in ten thousandths, right? You know, when you got your gloves on and stuff, ten thousandths isn't <laughs> you know, sort of a joke to try to measure. Anyway, this bolt, as I remember, came off an Israeli Corvette propeller, okay? Uh, and they were cracking. There's cracks right under the head here. Um, so uh, when we were cleaning up the lab a couple weeks ago, I retrieved one. There, there were, did you retrieve the other one, Matt? Yeah, it's up in my so it's up in his office now. I think I only had, I may have thrown another one out, but anyway. So, um, but the, actually the, the propeller bolts are about as sophisticated a bolting operation as I've ever seen using more grip bolts and stuff and measuring stretch. Now they also measure stretch on the connecting rods on, on aircraft, piston engines. So if you've got a Lycoming engine or a, a Teledyne Continental engine, um, when they tighten up um, the connecting rod, the connecting rod goes with a bearing against the uh, crankshaft and they have two bolts holding it on. Those bolts actually have ground top head and bottom end and they're only about two and a half inches long and you actually take a micrometer and you measure the bolt before and it's ground to within 2.623 you know inches plus or minus one thousandths of an inch and after you stretch it torque it you don't measure the you can you can uh, approximately measure the torque but you don't rely on torque because of all the variations in in friction and everything else you actually measure the stretch because Young's modulus doesn't change by very much. It's a lot, lot more precise than friction, relying on friction. And it might be eight thousandths of stretch on a two and a half inch long bolt, okay? And you can take 30 million times eight thousandths over two and a half inches, and you can calculate what the stress is in the bolt. And so by using that technique, you can get down to plus or minus 5% variation on the clamp up of the bolt. Whereas if you're just torquing something, your variation will be plus or minus 30 percent, okay? Torque wrenches are not very precise, okay? If you really, and actually many times in nuclear reactors they also do use stretch. But me measuring bolt stretch is a lot more precise than measuring bolt torque. Many people don't do either, and fortunately when they don't do either, I often get to put another one of my kids through school, okay, college, okay. Um, but if you look at the stress on a bolt, whoops, let's see, uh, what am I getting in the way here? Well, okay, I guess that's okay. So here's a bolt, and if you look at uh, different regions of the bolt, at different locations, here A, B, C, D, um, you'll get peaks in your stress. Now they put a nice fillet on here, but they didn't thin down the shank compared to the threads, you have a stress concentration underneath the head, you have a stress concentration right where the nut hits the first thread here, and then it decreases. So you have some pretty significant variations. If you look at bolt tolerances, this is, if you take class two threads, this is kind of a magnified version of the tightest clearance where the two fit really close, but the, this one's at the maximum and this one's at the minimum and you have very tight clearance. This is the amount of slop you've got in class two threads, which is this typical good thread, okay? There's good, better, and best, and um, this is actually the better class two, <clears throat> and that's how much slop you've got in a class two thread, okay? And so it turns out bolts actually are treated sort of like springs. Now, if you want to look at how strong bolts can be, we got lots of different materials, just like nails we make out of aluminum, out of bronze, out of lots of things. Um, ASTM A325 are the standard bolts you put in I-beams if you're building a building. Now, why would you use bolts to build a building? It's a lot easier to slip a bolt in than to get up there and weld the thing, 
I can slip the bolt in with the cranes kind of putting the beam down or the column down. I can slip the bolt in, put the nut on, and things aren't going anywhere. I can then come back and tighten them up. That's a lot faster and can be actually better tolerance in an erection than if you weld and you weld at the wrong angle or something and the thing's out of place and then you have to grind the weld off. So bolt, one of the advantages of bolting is it's, it can be fast in the field, faster in the field than in the shop. In the shop where you can fixture everything, sure, you'd rather weld everything together. But bolting has certain advantages. A325 is a typical high strength bolt. A490 is an ultra high strength bolt. The problem with these is that they're going to be, A490s are very susceptible to hydrogen embrittlement cracking. They have a very high ultimate strength, 165 KSI, about 100,000 100, in shear, which is the way they're usually loaded. Uh, if you go to A286, that's the 12 times as expensive stainless steel as carbon steel. By the way, these are probably, this is not much different than carbon steel. This is an alloy steel, low alloy steel. Um, and you got some pretty high strengths in some of these fancy precipitation hardness, hardened stainless. The strongest material on here is MP35N. MP35N is approximately, well, I just happen to have a data sheet on it that I printed out this morning. Somewhere, where's my data sheet? Uh, Oh, here it is. Okay. So, MP35N is one of the most fantastic materials I know. Um, metals. It's got a composition that's basically 35% nickel, it's about 20% chrome, it's 10% molybdenum, and the balance is cobalt, which is about 40% cobalt. Cobalt's not cheap. It's very expensive. Three, four times the price of nickel. Molybdenum's even more expensive than cobalt. Um, chromium, of course, that's just typical stainless steel. But nickel cobalt alloy, these are very, very expensive bolts. Probably more expensive than titanium on the high end of the nickel alloys, okay? So rather than the, the 100 to 1 figure I gave you for fasteners before, this is probably 200. This is on the 200 range. But it's a non-magnetic. It, um, the problem with it, it can only, it gets its strength from cold work guy in international nickel named Gaylord Smith invented this alloy back in the 60s. It's great for a lot of things like, uh, trying to find the, hmm. this morning I found some of the mechanical properties on it, this data sheet. Um, I've recommended it for um, aneurysm clips that go in the brain for medical application, okay? Won't show up on magnetic resonance imaging, won't mess up things for, for NMR. Uh, uh, very corrosion resistant, as good as titanium alloys in most cases. Uh, but what I was looking for was it the typical strengths at different, I'm looking at everything here, it's got it's got very good toughness. Hmm. Anyway, this stuff can have a tensile strength of 300 KSI, which is as good as the best steels for aircraft landing gears or other things. Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, but it can do that with 10% elongation and 50% reduction in area. There's no other material I've ever heard of that can give you that kind of ductility with that kind of strength. So among all metals, this is way out there. The problem is it gets its strength from cold work, so you can make it into two or three inch bolts 
if you start with a six inch diameter rod, but you can't make it into plate. You can make it into wire, so it's fine for medical implants and little sheet things that you make little clips for the brain or something. And it's good for some high strength bolts. I've heard of people using it on propellers, okay? I haven't done, I haven't seen that myself, but I've heard of it. I've also heard that there are four MP35N bolts that hold the fuselage of the 747 to the wing of the 747, okay? Now, you don't talk about holding the wing to the fuselage, to the, uh, the, f the wing to the fuselage, because when you're up there flying around, the fuselage is just being lifted up by the wing, right? So, it's, all it's doing is keeping, on the ground is keeping the wing from falling down, but up in the air, all it's doing is keeping the fuselage from sliding off the wing, okay? So it's not, but it's, there's not a lot of bolts, and they're MP35N bolts, yep. Yep. It's twice as strong. Yeah, it's a very, very complex stainless steel. It's heat treated in special ways. It's, it's a very complex stainless, very highly alloyed. It's not all that different than HY140 in a composition, if you know, or uh, no, not HY140, HY200. Are you a subber? Okay, so the Navy originally, after after they developed HY-80, they wanted to go to HY-100. And so I think the Nautilus was the first ship that had HY-80 in it in the 50s, sometime in the 50s. They had all kinds of hydrogen cracking problems, such that some of the first subs, they actually welded with austenitic stainless steel because they couldn't solve the hydrogen cracking problem. It took them about 10 years to really get their arms around that. And then they had the thresher problem and they had subsafe and all this other stuff. They didn't actually start putting HY100 into ships until the late 80s. There were two ships uh, before the Seawolf that they put modules, okay, cylinders in the center of the ship with HY100. Okay, I'm familiar with that because my first student ever still works at Electric Boat as a welding engineer. He was in charge of welding up those HY100 cylinders. And this, when the Seawolf had all its cracking problems, the two captains who were in charge of the ships came to me and said, well, what about our two ships with HY100 that are out there, okay? And I said, don't worry about it, it's okay. Just inspect them when they come back in. They're not gonna fall apart tomorrow. But they could fall apart, <laughs> anyway, never mind. They could fall apart if you didn't inspect them properly. Um, in any case, originally the Navy spent $50 million in the 60s developing HY-130, which was really supposed to be an HY-150, but they downgraded it. And I remember having to go meet with the chief engineer of the Na Navy in around 1990 and explaining to him that you couldn't, they were trying to sell the Seawolf as it was going to be an HY-130 ship. And I said, no, it's going to be a big enough challenge to go to HY-100. And it turns out it was, okay? Um, and I said, you're never gonna build a ship out of HY-130. But there were people in the Navy who said, well, we spent $50 million on it in the 50s. It must be worth something. And I said, well, just because you spent $50 million doesn't mean it was worth something. I mean, I mean let's be, be realistic. Anyway, um, they also tried to develop an HY-200. And they did, I think, build some some research, I'll call them research vessels that were sort of classified. And there have been some very special applications. But the H, this A286 is almost like the, um, the Air Force 1410 alloy, which is 10% cobalt alloy. Um, and it, very sophisticated strengthening mechanisms, but very, very intolerant of hydrogen. And so that's part of the problem with HY-130, HY-200, they just, that no one's ever really solved the hydrogen problems um, and been able to keep the toughness up and stuff. So I've run over a little bit today, but we'll finish up, we'll, we'll finish up bolting tomorrow uh, and go into casting. Actually, we'll go into materials manufacturing, I'll tell you why. Nanotechnology does not work for structural materials. And then we'll get to casting. So you, you never see like a Buckminster Fullerene skyscraper? On the moon, maybe, and I, when you get to the material selection part of things, 
I will explain why cost-wise there is a about five orders of magnitude, six orders of magnitude difference between the cost of a commercial ship